So, Gavin, how you been, man? Good. How have you been? Uh, not too bad. Long time no see. About this time last year, I think. Yeah. Yeah, damn near a, a year to date. Yeah. So, last year I met Gavin at the Louisville Farm Show. That's where we are right now. And thought we would get together and do a podcast. So, you know, how's the, um, how's the winter been in Missouri? Pretty mild, actually. Like, not even really much of a winter at all. A yeah, couple little snowstorms, but nothing like we're used to. Right. Yeah. So, what part of Missouri are you from? Northeast or East Central, depending on who you ask. Uh, we're about an hour and a half west of St. Louis. Okay. Okay. So, um, Gavin, you mind telling everybody a little bit about yourself? I mean, one thing that I find very interesting is that you are a first generation farmer and yep. a complete first generation farmer. Weren't farming, family wasn't farming before you, right? Right, right. So, uh, mom was a nurse and dad worked at a uh, factory, brick plant. They made uh, fire bricks. And he's retired now, so he helps out running if we need parts or food or something brought to the field. But nobody in my family farmed. The last person in my family to farm was my grandpa, and he passed away in 1977. Um, so from a young age, I knew I wanted to be a farmer, but didn't, you know, think it was possible. Uh, but got the chance to rent six acres when I was 19 years old. And the guy I was working for helping out, in, you know, part-time in between college classes, we used his equipment to plant and harvest that six acres. And I, I mean, I paid for it, uh, exchange of labor. We just took it off my yeah. hours I worked. Uh, so nothing was free or handed to me, but then slowly grew from there. The next year had like a hundred acres, bought a tractor, a old junk six row planner and just been stair stepping since. Okay. Sweet, man. So I've been kind of following you on Instagram. I mean, I think, when did you start farming? What year would that have been? 2017 was that six acres. Okay. How was that first year? <laughs> the beans were phenomenal uh, for my area at least our county average uh on beans is like 40 or 39 and the beans that year made 58 i mean it was only six acres so it's not we're not talking a whole lot i had like 350 bushels or something um but the, it was a very good year yield wise at least okay so. very big challenge i mean as far as starting with like no capital and all that good stuff or was it kind of a blessing that it started off at six acres so you could grow incrementally or yeah I, I think it was um looking back um you get your feet wet i don't think it'd be advantageous for anyone to start off with a thousand right. uh but you know starting off with six and getting my feet wet and figuring out how to work with the the crop input guys but you know getting the seed even though it's only six or seven bags of seed figuring out those relationships um on a small scale is great and then slowly building off of that um yeah, I, it'd be a lot to just, you know, take take over a farm just at the snap of a finger or something. I've seen it happen and it hasn't went well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when you rented these six acres, was this, um, like, was it already production ground or did you find someone that had some, like, a pasture field or something? Yeah, it was actually a, a friend of mine that I graduated high school with. Um, his dad had farmed but had passed away in a farming accident. And when that happened, all the land got sold off except for the house and like 30 acres of woods and this little six acre patch that was tillable. Um, and his brother had tried to farm for a few years and ended up moving away. So it had been farmed, um, but I just rented it from my buddy uh, that I graduated high school with because he bought the house and the, the 40 acres along with it and wanted someone to farm it. Okay. So that was my first six acres. After that was it's so random. I mean, CRP going back into production or uh, – Facebook ads, Craigslist ads. like I've seen your Facebook yeah. ads. <laughs> so those do work sometimes. Uh, yeah. I, just this year, actually, I rented another 50 off a of Facebook ad. And I've never grown I, – I can still proudly say that I've never, like, stolen a farm or, like, went and knocked on a door to take a farm from somebody. Uh, but I definitely do put my name out there. Yep. And the Facebook ad just said – I posted pictures of the crops I had, of me mowing the roadside ditches, and uh, said I'm a young guy looking for a chance. Don't want to – step on toes or take anything but if you're retiring or looking to make a change give me a shout i've honestly thought about stealing your ad and putting my name <laughs> in it. it it never dawned on me until youtubing when people would ask were you guys wanting to grow your farm well yeah i just thought that would be common knowledge that you know most farms are sure. wanting to expand yeah yeah I, i'm happy with the acres i'm at i wish they were closer to home i'm very scattered north to south i wish i could draw that in a little bit but starting from scratch you kind of just take what you can get and normally right. it's the table scrap so yeah so going back like how long did you how old were you when you realized that 
like farming is something you really want to pursue and it, how how old were you when it became like a realistic reality like it could happen uh <laughs> i mean when i was my mom tells the story i was three or four years old i mean i was young still running yeah still just running around the house not knowing how to write the alphabet or nothing i mean i was young and when a tractor would be going down the gravel road we live on i would watch it out of the kitchen window and when it passed the house i would run across the house and watch it out the dining room window (laughs) so i was addicted to tractors because what young kid doesn't love dirt and diesel smoke and you know everything that goes on outside and this was going on we grew up in the country lived in the country uh so i saw it outside my window every day uh just no one in my family did it but as i got older i'd go and ride with these local farmers there's a couple guys that farm around mom's house mom and dad's house uh and i would just drill them with questions so <laughs> after sc- you know in elementary school middle school i would just go talk farming with them and then i got into high school and got my license and needed a job so then i started working for a couple local guys uh and then took off to college because i wasn't farming when i graduated high school didn't think it was very pl- plausible and i uh, went to the university of missouri to get an ag degree i figured i'd go get some corporate job and in, in the city some ag corporate job and work for 30 years and then retire and buy a farm and just, you know, be a hobby farmer. And then life started happening fast and now I'm just <laughs> yeah. a full-time farmer. Yeah. yeah that, that's awesome. So one thing I get all the time on the YouTube channel is do I think it's possible for a first time or a first generation farmer to, to start in mm-hmm. today's age, like with equipment being as high as it is and everything. Sure. And you're an example I point to a lot and I, really I knew probably six first generation farmers now, some, they vary in age from anywhere mm-hmm. from 70, I mean, down to, are you 26? Uh, 25. 25? Yep, 25. But uh, I definitely think it's a possibility. Is that something when you hear people say that it's impossible, does that anger you or anything? Or uh, No, but I, I can't say that I don't know it didn't, I, it didn't add some to my drive just to prove that you could do it. Um, but I, I wanted to farm since I was a little kid. I wanted to be a farmer. I used to cut pictures at a tractor house and make a scrapbook of what equipment <laughs> I wanted. I mean, I was a... <laughs> I don't know if it was OCD or ADHD. I probably had something. I, I just loved farming. Everything about it. I just inhaled it. So I knew I wanted to be a farmer. Uh, and then I just kind of stumbled into the opportunities as they came to me and pieced together a little puzzle and made it fit. Um, it's definitely doable. You have to be very. Uh, you have to be very disciplined. You have to be very. Op- you have to keep your eyes open for opportunity because I took chances on really junky farms pretty far away from home just because i wanted the opportunity that some people yeah. might not jump on that but that led to other opportunities so uh, it's hard to say yeah but yeah yeah i wanted to be a farmer and you can definitely do it but it's never angered me to hear someone say that i couldn't i guess i just used it as fuel i know one thing that bothers me about that is it doesn't give anyone hope like when people say it's impossible to start farming as a first generation farmer it's like well, where's the hope in that for anyone that wants this farm i mean i know you're not the only person that was probably growing up in that era that wanted to farm and sure. how many people heard that and just well you're right it can't happen yeah i've always taken that sort of thing as fuel to actually do it but i know lots of people take it and they just yeah. decide not to the interesting thing about being a first gen guy though is i don't have a dad or grandpa telling me i can't or can do something right. so i mean yes it's cool to be a first generation guy but i think it's so much cooler to be a fourth or fifth because Passing down that farm and keeping it in the family and learning how to work with family. Like, if I want to do something, I just, I kind of go do it. But the guys that have to work and communicate and and have these relationships built into the business as they come into it, that's impressive. I mean, that's really neat. And and the the guys that have been farming for a long time don't give themselves enough credit. I'm not so sure that isn't harder than just becoming a first-gen farmer. Because you can find access to capital and you can go buy machinery at an auction. But it's hard to, to uh, keep those communication lines open with a family member and, and pass the farm down. I mean, you do see multi-generation farms selling out every yeah. every year, unfortunately. It is a uh, definitely a, a challenge. I know, like growing up, I thought farming every day would be, you know, tractors, machinery, working on wrench it, or wrenching on stuff. Yeah. But the older I get, the more I realize it's more office work, relationship building, relationship managing. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot more. I mean, I'm sure you're discovering all these things every oh, every yeah. day as well. I mean, working with landlords, working with sales reps, and all this stuff. But the vacation of farming is getting to go sit in the tractor. Yeah. I yeah. was 17. I started working for a farmer and worked for him through the rest of high school. Still great friends with him. Call him all the time. And uh, 
I started. He said, I hope you like power washing equipment. He's like, because this tractor driving thing is just a couple weeks a year. <laughs> you know, it's just because he didn't have any livestock. It was just planting and harvest and some tillage. But other than that, it was shop work. Well, when we were doing the podcast with my dad uh, a couple weeks ago, we were kind of going through the history of our farm. And he goes, you know, I really don't sit in a tractor much. I said, I sit in a sprayer a lot. Mm-hmm. But he plants corn, and that takes, I mean, with high-speed planters now, I mean, 50 seat hours maybe yeah yeah it's best. not a lot in the grand scheme of things yeah. yeah i mean like he said when he was younger spent most of his life <laughs> his early in days the tractor. Yeah, yeah not so much anymore hmm. yeah so after you um you know got through your first year at six acres i mean were you growing then at that point the next year was it back to six or? uh so that second year i had uh, a 40 off of craigslist and man uh, craigslist i forgot that still existed <laughs> people yeah. probably thought that was a scam uh, yeah and and the guy i didn't i didn't meet that landlord for two years he happened to just be out there i think when we were spraying one day just looking at his farm but he lived in st louis so around us there's a lot of landowners that come out of the city and okay. they buy an, an 80 or 160 or 40 investment. to deer hunt on an investment you know they want to go out there in the country and have a farm but then they need someone to farm the ground so I didn't put the Craigslist ad in my local Craigslist. I put it in the city Craigslist. You might be giving away your secrets. Well, uh, hey, if someone wants to start farming, take all my <laughs> secrets. You know, use them to your advantage. You know, use what I've done to help build your operation. I love sharing those tips. Uh, but, yeah, I put it in the city Craigslist, and he called me. I said, dude, I want to farm so bad. I said, I'm young. I, I have nothing to prove I'm even a good farmer other than six acres, and I want to. <laughs> and he sent me a rent contract, and I'm – Pay it on time and take care of the ground and fix some ditches and mow the, the waterways. And I still farm it. And it's a great 40 acres. Like probably some of my most productive ground is that first, first 40 that guy gave me a chance on. Uh, you and talk him into investing in more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, dude, the deer hunting's really good right beside it. <laughs> right, right. And come kill all the deer because they're eating the corn. Uh, and then a 40 coming out of CRP. So I had like 100 that second year. And then a, like 200 the third year. And then I made a, I rented a bunch of state ground. So then I made a jump to like 600. And then. So was that state ground like prison, old prison farm uh, or uh, state park? Or? Uh, state conservation ground. So I guess it got left to the state of Missouri. It was like a, like a large, like 6,000 acre track that some rich guy must have owned. I don't know the history on it. I know at one point it was like a, a buffalo ranch. Okay. Um, but it was like 6,000 contiguous acres, and it got left to the state of Missouri. And so now it's like prairie land, and they also manage the wilderness or, or the woods. But then there's 600 acres tillable. And if I'm farming that 600 tillable acres, then they don't have to pay conservation agents to mow it and burn it. So I'm actually doing them a favor by farming it. Uh, but it's a bunch of small patches that no, – I knew I was in trouble when I was the only person who showed up to bid on it. Oh, okay. And if there's 600 acres available and no one else shows up to bid, you're like, eh, maybe, maybe I'm stupid was for doing this. Was it a sealed this. bid when you submitted it? Oh, yeah, it was that's even bid. worse. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, I kind of shot myself in the foot there. Yeah. So I made that big jump. And then uh, I also rented another big state tract, which was another uh, just shy of 400. So that put me just shy, or right around 1,000, like 1,100. So um, this was in a three- or four-year gap? Yeah, this happened over the course, well, since 2017, I guess, and it's 2023 now, so 17, 18, 18. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this will be my seventh crop this year. And then I um, had another huge jump this past year, picked up a bunch of acres, so this spring is going to be so nuts. I'm, like, it's very daunting. I'm, I'm excited for it, but it's also scary to think, like, th- there's just going to be a lot going on. So how do, how do you manage the equipment requirements? So, like, what, your six acres, I mean – you're probably able to do that with, you know, pretty dated equipment that was yeah. reasonably priced. You start getting to 11, 12, 1,300 acres, I mean, you're going to start needing a little yeah. bit more dependable equipment probably. I mean, newer, modern equipment. How is that? Been? I mean, it's got to be a huge challenge, doesn't it? I mean, especially doubling every couple of years. I mean. Right. Uh, so one thing that's really worked in my favor, and I'm afraid that, we could be looking at an 80s type thing going on if you look yeah. at how the 70s went. But one thing that's worked in my favor is this crazy inflation. So every piece of equipment I've bought, I've been able to run for a year or two years and turn around and sell it for more than I paid for it oh, and jump cool. into the next bigger piece. And that is awesome. But for young guys my age, that it can also like don't get in the habit of doing that because this equipment's not supposed to increase in value as right. you use it. it. It's usually dropping. So that's helped me expand 
Uh, but I'm trying to get to a spot where it's more manageable and like I can just coast right. for a couple of years just with the equipment I have. Cause you also run the risk of, well, me buying used equipment. I've always getting flat tires. Because you normally you buy equipment, the tires are shot on. I was thinking about title and this, the flat tire king. <laughs> so the flat tire deal, or if you buy something with an engine, it could blow up tomorrow. You never right. know. Right. So it's also risky to always be upgrading equipment. But I've had to because the stuff I started with definitely couldn't farm what I've got now. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, at six row, you'd, you'd, you'd be a while. Right. You'd oh, my a, gosh. you need a just, fleet of them. Yeah. <laughs> so this year, I th- we're definitely running one 16 row, and we might be running two. Okay. Um. We'll just see how it all pans out. So, so the first year you were just soybeans. Yeah, just yeah. So yeah. when did I like right now? When I think of Gavin Spore, I think of Gavin Spore popcorn. Mm-hmm. So when did the popcorn come into it? Popcorn came in that second year I farmed. So that patch that had uh, soybeans on it that first year was uh, popcorn. The second year, <laughs> and my planner screwed up a chain jump to sprocket. I actually planted that popcorn like forty five thousand, fifty thousand population. So what's the normal popcorn population? Uh, I do like twenty eight to thirty. Okay. So I was dropping almost double, but I didn't have a monitor in that old six row. Right. I just was guessing. And all of a sudden, I ran out, and half the field wasn't planted yet. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Uh, but I, I had 15 acres of popcorn the second year I farmed, and that was a total just faith in myself that I could grow a new crop because there was no market for that. If I didn't sell it, like, no, I was the only popcorn farmer in the county. Like, that was that. I was the biggest popcorn farmer in the county, but it was because I was the only one, and that was 15 <laughs> acres. Uh so we grew 15 acres of popcorn. And the reason I did that is because I didn't have that many acres at that point. It was like 100, 200 acres. And crop prices were still like, you know, $3 corn at that point. I needed some extra income off fewer acres. I was in college full time, so I couldn't sell vegetables at a roadside stand. They Or, you know, sweet corn goes bad right. in two weeks. The popcorn, I could throw it in a bag and it would last for a year or two years. So it fit in my goals and it fit in my college schedule. Because I could go sell it on the weekends, sell it after class. You sell it around Christmas time, carry it all through the summer. Uh, so that really fit well, and it's expanded also and uh, is a lot of fun. So how did you come up? So I, I mean, I've farmed all my life, and until I started YouTubing, I thought everyone farmed exactly like us, like to venture out into a whole new crop with no market whatsoever never even dawned on me. So how yeah. how, did, how are you like, you know what, I think, I think we're just going to try popcorn. <laughs> I don't even know, man. It was like, just, did you have someone that you were able to, hey, like, what kind of ROI are you getting on an acre of popcorn? Did you have anyone to bounce that kind of stuff off of or just research online? or? Yeah, so I networked with a – when I, once I had the idea of trying popcorn out, I immediately went to Instagram and just searched popcorn farmer, popcorn field, uh, just any of the hashtags related to it. And I found a couple popcorn farmers in Kansas and Nebraska and Indiana – and just messaged them and asked them for tips, where they bought their seed, how they managed it, who they sold to, nutrition facts, you know, where'd you get your barcodes for your packaging, all that sort of thing. And they're all extremely helpful. I mean, these are great young family farm, you know, couples that wanted to bring some more income to the farm. So they're doing the same thing I am. Okay. Um, and they're scattered all across the country. And so ask them questions. But other than that, it was just, I, was, I totally winged it. I planted the 15 acres. I didn't know what was going to happen. So how did that first harvest go? Pretty good. Other than a, a huge windstorm knocked like half of my crops over. Is this how you started selling individual ears of popcorn? Uh-huh. Yes. So I remember seeing that, I think, on Instagram yeah, at some point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this windstorm that went through. When I started planting popcorn, every Sunday after church, I would go out to the popcorn field and make a little Facebook video and just talk about what was going on in the field. Uh, and I did that throughout the whole growing season. So before I ever had a kernel to sell, I had people invested in the story and wanting the popcorn. So were there other, I'm trying to think, so this would have been 18? Yes. So that was kind of when, in my opinion, when farming social media really started to take off. Yes. So were you were able to capture some of that, I yeah. guess, that momentum and growth? Completely on accident. But yeah, I yeah. captured some of it. Because I knew the, the social media thing. If, that's how I've been able to sell the popcorn is because I can ship it across the whole U.S. I don't have to just sell it to people in my backyard. So I figured there was something to it, but I didn't know how big it would get. And uh, just started making a video every Sunday after church. And then this windstorm came through and just flat knocked everything down. Thankfully, the popcorn was mature enough. It was You still, already had a crop. The, the, the crop started there. It just knocked it down and made it difficult to harvest. Um, but when that windstorm came through, that video of me talking about the popcorn falling over went viral. And a news crew came out and like took pictures of it. Because a lot of the farmers lost their crops. 
just completely knocked him flat. Uh, so then that video, it was kind of a, a diamond in the rough scenario because it sucked that my popcorn fell over, but it like really increased the coverage that, it, yeah. you know, that I'm a young popcorn guy. Um, but it was a pain in the butt to pick with a combine. So we picked a bunch of it by hand right on the cob. Uh, me and the local FFA chapter went out there. and So you like walking through down popcorn, yeah, picking it up? Yeah, picking, picking the stalk up, ripping the ear off, and then, you know, letting the stalk back down and husking the ear and throwing it in a Walmart sack. And I Fifteen had, acres worth. We didn't pick all of it by hand. We probably, we picked a little over an acre, maybe two acres okay. by hand. Uh, so that's a lot of freaking. A lot. I mean, for the listeners, I mean, if you're planting, well, this time you probably had your uh, your planter a little. Well, was this the forty five thousand plants per acre a year? Uh, yes. So forty five thousand, roughly forty thousand <laughs> pieces of popcorn so, per so acre. So much popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I had it was me, and then I was staring at this field because I'd get out there really early in the morning. I thought, God, this is going to take me a month. There's no way I can do this on my own. So my little brother was still in high school at the time. Well, I had him out there, and I said, I'll give you ten bucks an hour. Help me out. And I said, Hey, I'll give you an extra dollar an hour for every one of your buddies you can get out here. So then he was out there. He was making twenty bucks an hour. He had all his buddies out there making ten bucks an hour, and I'm just standing there watching them pick my popcorn. <laughs> and and they would pick it and put it in a Walmart sack. And when the Walmart sack was full, they'd drop it on the ground. And then so as they were going through picking it, I would come up and grab the Walmart sacks and throw them in my truck bed. And we'd take them back up to the house. I didn't have a warehouse. I didn't have a building at the time. I bought a shipping container. That was my first warehouse. Was a shipping container off a of Craigslist. I cut a hole in the side of the shipping container and put a big exhaust fan in. So that was climate controlled at that point because <laughs> I had a, <laughs> I had a an air vent on this shipping container. So what uh, for popcorn? I mean, I the only experience I have with popcorn. One of our neighbors grows like a hundred acres a year. Mm-hmm. I know it has a floppy task. Mm-hmm. That's about all I know about it. So what kind of moisture? I mean, you dry it down just like you do yellow dent corn? Yeah, so I let it dry down in the field. It needs to be a little drier than yellow dent corn. Uh, it's like 13%? Yeah, thir- 13 14%. If you get too far out of those parameters, it it will either split open but not explode or just not pop at all. Like okay. the old maids at the bottom of your bag, yep. um, those are just really dry, old, you know, crusty kernels. I know when I bite into them, they hurt my teeth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if they split open and kind of crackle but don't fully explode they're way too wet uh, so it's a fine line you got to dance or i let it dry down in the field because i have a hard time getting it dialed in once it's in the bin okay once it's in the bin well i'll run air on it to keep it fresh through the winter time but i let it dry in the field so i'm guessing if you don't condition it right you run the same risk we do with yellow corn like it can mold or sure yeah yeah, yeah it can mold or just if you get it too dry which i've never had popcorn too dry it won't pop at all yeah okay but definitely being too wet Especially if, you know, whenever you start selling to kettle corn companies, it they want it to pop and look a certain way and expand a certain amount. If your moisture's not right, you're not going to hit those parameters. Your, your popcorn's kind of useless. You know what you need? You need a GSI grain view system. I do. Man, I need, honestly, I need some grain bins. I still don't have a single grain bin other than the two little 3,000 bushel bins I rent for popcorn. Like my bro crop, I don't have any. So, yeah, GSI, you know, Brock, Sucup, whoever, I need some grain bins. <laughs> <laughs> So after that, after that, what, what did you do with the corn once it was in the storage container? Mm-hmm. Um, so after harvest, it went in a grain bin. And then I had grand plans of cleaning it all myself. I bought an old clipper seed cleaner. Well, it was taking me like an hour to get a couple bags, like as clean as I wanted it to. Uh, so then I talked to a, a popcorn company in Kansas I had stayed in contact with, and they told me about this big cleaning facility they take all their stuff to. So then we just grained back that popcorn out into a, a semi-truck, and a local trucking company hauled it out to Kansas. Well, they ran it through this huge cleaner and color sorter and, and a, a robotic bagger, and they had cleaned a semi-load in like an hour and put it on a van trailer and shipped it right back in 50-pound bags. So then it was like seed sacks of corn you'd plant. That's what went in the shipping container. And then out of there, I would just pull bags out as I sold them. Kettle corn companies would buy the 50-pound bag, or uh, if I was selling into grocery stores, we'd take that 50-pound bag and break it down into a two-pounder and sell little two-pound bags of kernels. So that work there, you're doing manual. I mean, yeah, you're yeah, yeah, that's out all two by pounds. hand. Yeah. So uh, it's ac- well, I say two pounds. It's technically 28 ounces, and that's what the package says is 28 ounces. A mason jar, a quart mason jar, holds 28 ounces of kernels. So you're just scooping them. Scoop dumping. 28 ounces, dump it in a bag, slap a label on it, heat seal it, put a barcode, and then out the door it goes. 
so with that, how are you marketing that? Are you take are you going to each individual grocery store and saying, Hey, I'm Gavin Spore, I'd like to sell popcorn? <laughs> yeah. So when I first started out here lately, the two pound bags, I've mainly been focusing on online sales because it takes so much time and fuel to deliver to every individual grocery That's store. That's what I was thinking. That has to be about a full time job to keep the, yeah. like a, a shelf stocked full of corn. Right. Corn. So, so I built up to where I was in like 16 or 18 stores, but I've dialed back now. I'm only in like five or six stores, and it's just like the ones close to home that I was originally in um, that were with me from the very beginning. Uh, but yeah, they. Uh, I would just walk into a store in between college classes, literally in between college classes when most guys would be sitting and watching Netflix or playing video games. Like I'm going to go cold call grocery stores because I have nothing better to do. What What is the, the 16 year old behind the counter th- say whenever <laughs> this college dude walks, in, Hey, you guys want to buy some popcorn? Well, that's the thing. I didn't know who to talk to. So I just go in and find the closest cashier and be like, Hey, I need to talk to your manager. And they're like, what I do? I'm like, no, no, no. I just, I, I got a product. I want to figure out what it takes to sell it. And I did this also before that crop was ready. So I was walking in in September, October before harvest happened. And they said, you need tamper-proof packaging, uh, barcode, nutrition facts, expiration dates. And I was like, okay, cool. So I'd, and then I'd get their information, say, hey, I'm going to have this ready. And I'd ask what, their, what kind of margins they wanted, what they expected price to be, what they were currently selling popcorn for. And uh, then I'd go back to the uh, fraternity house and sit down at my desk and go back to the drawing board, find all this stuff. And then once I had the product ready to sell, I'd already developed a relationship with the grocery store because I'd already been in there talking to them. So I brought them back the package and let them look at it. And they were like, hey, okay, we'll take two dozen bags or we'll take, uh, you know, two dozen bags and 48 ears, the the vacuum sealed cobs. And I was building stands. I figured this out too. Uh, I didn't, it was very difficult to take shelf space from another product that was already selling successfully. I thought, well, I don't, I don't need shelf space. I'll just build a wooden stand. Uh, so I bought a bunch of cheap, like, 1x8s and 1x12s at some farm auction and sanded them down and built these little stands that could hold two dozen bags. And it worked great for me and the grocery store. They didn't have to take shelf space from another product. And it also got my product off the shelf and right in front of the customer because it would sit on an end cap or right by the... It doesn't just blend in with the rest yeah, of the Yeah, it doesn't blend in. It stands out. So it worked great for everybody. And uh, it was kind of just, like, trial and error. I, there was no rhyme or reason to it. I'm no like mad genius who thought of this stuff overnight. I just, just trying to figure out what tried it out. You know, if it didn't work, I'd stop doing it. If it worked good, I'd do more of that and started following the path to whatever you consider success. So, what is a what is a two pound bag of popcorn sell for? Um, I'm selling mine like on the on the online website five ninety five, and that's what I started selling it for when I first began. And I haven't raised my prices. I really probably should. Because inflation's nuts. Packaging's expensive. Shipping, I mean, there's a lot of money. That popcorn itself is not worth nothing, but it's your packaging and your time packaging and the cost to run your website and the cost, you know, PayPal wants their cut. And it, it gets very expensive very quickly. Okay. Uh, but yeah, about in the small quantities, like three bucks a pound is what I'm at. Okay. So, like, the packaging and all that material, is that stuff you do in-house, or is that subbed out to another company, or how, how's that? Yeah, so the, the two-pound bags we still do in-house. Um, I actually bought a abandoned floor mat factory two years ago, right when COVID hit, in the next town over. So I moved six miles north from where I originally grew up. There was this floor mat factory. Mom and pop, but they built up to, like, 40 employees at one point. But they were making floor mats for, for local dealerships, or someone could call in and get, like, their name put on a floor mat for their specific make and model vehicle and they'd ship it out to you well the husband passed away and the wife sold the business so then there was this giant warehouse and a house that they used as an office well lots of people wanted the warehouse and lots of people wanted the house but nobody wanted both of them i just happened to be coming right out of college and really needing a warehouse and a house so i snagged it and we've been in the process of turning that into like a popcorn factory and we completely gutted the house and turned it from an office space back into living quarters again. So, so is that where you live now then? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's where I've got that home gym we were talking about yep. and yeah. Yep, gotcha. Gotcha. So now how do you split your acres? I mean, is it majority row crop and then partially popcorn or is popcorn a heavier part of it? I mean, uh how- not yeah, not near as much as people would think. So I only do about 40 acres of popcorn. Well, that's what I was thinking. I mean, I mean even if, what did you say, an average popcorn, 70 bushel? It's, yeah, 75 if you're comparing it to corn. Popcorn's more like by the pound. So like 5,000-pound popcorn is pretty good popcorn. 6,000-pound popcorn is pretty, pretty good popcorn. So 
six thousand five thousand pounds an acre on forty acres and you're selling in two bag quantities right, individually. I mean that's a lot that's of that's a lot of oh. selling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um so the popcorn itself is not a huge majority of my acres now, especially as the row crop has just gone wild the past eighteen months. Do you see the um the popcorn, like the notoriety and uh, publicity you get from that does that help you gain row crop acres you think Man, it's so hard to say yeah i it it's so hard to measure that you, you never know i mean i've never had anyone rent me ground strictly because i'm the popcorn farmer it may have like helped unexpectedly because they might recognize my name or know that i'm a local farmer i'm sure that's definitely influenced it uh but i can't say that like i've only got ground because i'm a popcorn farmer yeah um yeah i don't know so if you um are you still the only popcorn farmer in the area? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's that I know of. Yeah. There's somebody that might like grow a patch for an FFA project or something, but I'm pretty sure I'm like the only commercial popcorn farmer in the county. Okay. So have you got any, um, so like selling to like, um, like I guess the bigger commercial um, popcorn branch you see is like in Walmart or Sam's or mm-hmm. something like that. Are they getting their popcorn from like a grower like yourself or is that? A contractor? How how does that process? Yeah, work? Um, so I'm not super familiar with it because I've never grown for like an Orville or a Weaver yep. or whatever. Um, but I know it's contract, and they normally have a home for that popcorn before the seed ever gets planted. Okay. And, and so then they f- like the guys that are growing it commercially, are, they've got a home for it. They know what their price scale is at, based off of their yield and and quality. Um, and then once they grow those acres, those acres get delivered to the end processor, the the big. And there's a couple of them throughout the country, but all of mine is just direct sale straight to the end user. Gotcha. So, um, I mean, like with yellow dent corn, we can't really keep our seed from year mm-hmm. to year. Is popcorn the same way, or? Yeah, so popcorn's a hybrid, and I've never kept seed back. Okay. Um, I've always just bought new stock every gotcha. every year. Gotcha. Okay. So what um. What kind of specialized equipment is there involved in popcorn? Or is it the same equipment you're using in row crop? So that's another reason I decided to go with popcorn is there's same. really nothing. I use the same planter, same meters. Uh, I might drop a few more doubles just because the, the kernels Small. are so much smaller. But everything's the same. Even the combine and the head's the same. you got to pull your stripper plates or your deck plates in real tight on your, on your corn head because that stalk is so skinny. Um, and then you change you know, your sieve and rotor and fan. But other than that, it's all the same. I mean, there's no difference. Same auger, same grain bin, nothing changes. Gotcha. Okay. What um, what kind of equipment are you running? Uh, so this year, or I guess last harvest, I ran a 2188 and a 1680 Case IH combine. I demoed a gleaner. I want a gleaner so bad. <laughs> God, I want it's killing me. Um, but we've got a red dealer close and an independent mechanic that's just really good yep. on those older red machines. And it's hard to get away from those because they're just they just go. Um, so I ran those two combines, a uh, thousand bushel Parker cart on a John Deere 8400 tractor. Um, and like springtime, I've got an 8400 John Deere and a 4960. Uh, this spring, both of those will probably go on Kinsey planters. So I have a 2600 and I'm in the process of buying a 3600. So we'll be running uh, two split row box fill planters. And um, I got a 36 foot field cultivator. We'll probably put on some old four wheel drive or something, and knock out a bunch of tillage. And uh, spraying, I've got a Case 3185 sprayer. It's like an early 2000s. Working on getting an Apache. Okay. Uh, if I don't end up with an Apache, I might look for a deer, but I'm I'm really excited to try an Apache out, and I hope we make that happen. Yeah, well, uh, funny story about Apache. So we've never ran an Apache, but there are a couple in our area. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, they, they intrigue me. My father sprays. He's very pro front mount boom. I think it would be really hard for him to get away with that or get away from that. The Apache rep came down and was wanting us to demo one yeah. a couple of years ago. And um, we were sitting there in the office having a meeting, and all of a sudden my dad's dog and my dog do not get along, and we have the worst dog fight we've had in a long time. Oh, no. I mean, like, dogs are about to kill each other. The Apache rep's sitting in the office, and me and dad are pulling these dogs apart, and there's blood. Oh, there's no. cussing. I'm shooting a gun into the dirt trying to get them apart, and this goes on for 20 minutes. <laughs> we finally get these dogs apart, and there's just blood all over us. I mean, it, it was pretty – it was a Michael Vick-level dog fight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
that Apache rep goes, see you guys later. And he left, and we haven't heard from him since. <laughs> Dear Apache, maybe reach back out. You might get to demo him something. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, uh, I, they're light, and they're very mechanical. And right. And there's just less stuff to go wrong with them. There's a local farmer that's got two of them, and they're just – their big family operation and they're just they don't have enough reliable help around uh so they're going to hire their spraying done so they're going to sell their apaches and that's i'm looking at getting one of them yeah uh but if i don't then i'll probably get like a 47 30 deer or something 48 30 yeah uh yeah i'm i haven't done much i used to have a custom spraying business but as the row crop operations grown you got to have somebody else do something you can only do so much so i've hired a lot of spraying done the past year year and a half and but there's a lot of money to be saved doing it yourself right so we're really gonna get back I mean, into it like i mean i guess the sexy things in farming are combines and tractors but right like in our operation our sprayer is probably more of a pivotal piece of equipment than anything we run sprayer and uh office you know those two seats make you a lot of money they do and i mean really it probably gets used the most on our on mm-hmm. our operation i mean like wheat, we grow wheat. And I think you grow winter wheat, don't you? Yeah, I'm no professional, but I have. You we know, spray acres. that freaking wheat like six or seven uh, times. Like, oh, I, every time the weedy grass comes up, oh, get the freaking sprayer out. Here we go again. <laughs> Gonna go raise the poverty grass. Do you raise pretty good wheat around you? Yeah, um, I think our ten year average is probably mid nineties. Wow, that's pretty good wheat. Yeah, um, that's, well, I say 10-year average, so that's probably on three-quarters acres. The other marginal ground that we grow wheat on is probably more like in the 75 range. 75. And then you double crop it? We do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You guys are probably, you're probably pretty similar climate does as far as um, yeah like the latitudes. Yeah, we're right on the line of being able to insure double crops. So there's an interstate yeah. that cuts Missouri in half. Below the interstate, you can insure double crop. Above it, you can't. Or historically, you've not been able to. Uh, and we're right on that interstate. So like, our double crops are just figured in with our first crop. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yep, so what kind of... Uh, Grace, you want to join in? We can get another mic out. I think, we're, I think we're good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Is it too close? No, it sounds fine. Well, you're right next to me. I don't know how much is the speaker and how much is your voice. I don't know. Do I sound okay? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Like I say, I, I don't claim to know what I'm doing. I just turn <laughs> knobs and push buttons, and <laughs> there's flashy lights, and we just kind of go with it. Whatever works. Yep. So you want to introduce uh, your girlfriend there, Gavin? If you have video, this is my beautiful girlfriend, Grace, the <laughs> farmer Grace. If you are only listening on audio, then... It's just her voice. But yeah, this is <laughs> the Farmer Grace Emick from Lewisport, Kentucky. Hello. All right. So that is one thing I was going to touch on. I know just kind of watching you guys on Instagram, I mean, it's really neat to see like two people I've been following on Instagram for a while, and now you two are boyfriend and girlfriend. I yeah. Mean, it's it's yeah. kind of neat. <laughs> In fact, I think I met both of you down here last year about That's this time. Where uh-huh. we met was at Farm Show. Oh, no. Here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, a year anniversary of us meeting. Okay. Yep. Okay. Got, I, I got a random message and thrown into an Airbnb with like seven people I had never met before, all that were doing <laughs> ag stuff online, and Grace was one of them. Okay. So. You had, Did you have blue hair last year, purple hair? I had red hair last year throw here. a dart at a board it'll be one of the hair colors she's <laughs> pretty had. much i've had all of them <laughs> gotcha okay <laughs> so uh grace where, where are you from i'm from kentucky i'm on the west side of kentucky okay it's in the um i'm in the river bottoms is where i'm at on okay. the ohio river bottoms so when so my dad watches youtube all the time and every did you see such and such gender in western Kentucky? I'm like, no, Dad. I, I wasn't watching the exact same YouTube video that you were watching. <laughs> well, Jesus Christ, I didn't even know there was fire ground in Kentucky. <laughs> every, like, every, at least once a week. So I'm guessing that that's the area you're in, I mean, as far as, like, flat, nice mm-hmm. farm ground. Yeah, it's pretty nice. And then you go much further south, it gets pretty hilly. Okay. Yeah. So we're pretty lucky with where we're at. Are you guys corn, beans, mm-hmm. weed, or anything? Just or? corn and beans. We used to uh, raise tobacco and... We had a little bit of wheat, but we don't do that anymore. Okay. Are you guys close to Ohio or close to Mississippi or both? Or? Uh, we're right on the Ohio. Mm, not really that close to the Mississippi. Okay. Probably three hours, if I had to guess. Okay. Gotcha. So how far are you guys apart? Five hours on the dot. According to Google Maps, you can make it there a lot quicker than that. 
You just have to ignore how fast you're driving. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah. I used to complain about having to take my wife home, and she lived 20 minutes away. 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man. So how, how's that been? Not I'm bad, really. We have done a lot of traveling in the winter. Just in general, so. Right. Why don't you just watch your Instagram stories? It seems like you guys are <laughs> We're always pretty on awesome. the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, going to Farm Progress last year, at the end of the summer, the FBN thing in Omaha. Like, we always find something fun to do while we're hanging out. Like, there's always somewhere we're going. Uh, or like, buying. I bought a Mack semi-truck in Texas. So, like, we spent a couple days together just going down to Dallas, Texas, and bringing that truck back to my place in Missouri. So, yeah, we travel a lot. So how <laughs> how was it going sight unseen buying a truck in Texas and then driving it that far? <laughs> <laughs> I bought it on an auction. All I knew is it started. Like I didn't know if it moved. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing. And so we threw an air compressor and some some like you know mechanics Did tools. Did you have a flat? No. That is a shock. I was very I surprised. No. And the tires looked brand new. I like we got we showed up. I was like, oh my god, like this. Bet there's one sitting there flat now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, said that. the thing yeah. is, that I had to put all brand new tires on the whole truck. Every single tire got replaced, but they looked brand new. The tires were like 20 years old Dry and had like a quarter inch worn off of them. So I bobtailed at home and it was fine. And I talked to the local tire shop. I said, check these out. They said that yeah, you can drive around bobtailing, but you throw a whole semi load of corn on there and start climbing some hills, like you're gonna have issues quick. I thought, okay, we'll just. With my luck with tires, just put all new ones on and we'll just roll with <laughs> what, it. What model Mac is it? Is it an R model? Or yeah, it? yeah, it's a mid '80s Mac R model, and we showed up and fired the truck up and it started. I was like, okay, well that's a good sign. Uh, checked all the fluids and hit the road and drove 12 hours home without, I mean, nothing. I had a tire that was a little low. We topped off. I was it, very worried because that front hub was shattered. Yeah, the it the s- to be. the sight glass on the front hub. On the well, passenger like, side, no oil inside of it. Then it, no. They, yeah. <laughs> so she, we ran. Whenever she came to Missouri from Kentucky, she had to take a huge detour and go to a truck stop, or, or like a truck parts store to get the right hub, or the hub cover, because uh, I called like 15 different places and they didn't have it. So she snagged one in Southern Illinois and then came to Missouri and then we headed to Texas from there. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, we made it home, and it ran good all fall. Like, just changed the fluids in it when I got home. And so, what motor engine or what motor transmission combo you got? It's got a nine-speed and a th- I don't know whatever the Mac motor was at that time. Like the the most common one. I, don't, I couldn't even tell you. Three hundred, I think. Yeah, three hundred or three fifty. I don't know. So I've gathered from from your social media, you guys also have several R models, mm-hmm. a couple at least. Yeah, we have two of them, and they're both eighty five models. Okay. They're pretty much the exact same truck. The only difference is the one we just got, which is the one I drive, is supposed to have a Mac Trans. So it's it's got a gold dog on it, and the other one's a silver. Okay. Okay. I know nothing of what that means. I've never. Done <laughs> <Mac>. <laughs> so the silver dog. Uh, our red one is a silver dog, and it's in Econodyne, which just means that it's not all Mac. Okay. And then the white one we just got is a Maxidyne, which just means that it's all Mac, and it has a gold dog on it. Okay, gotcha. Hood, the hood ornament. Yeah, gold. hood ornament. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My uncle, he used he used to work for us. He's a pivotal part of my childhood as far as mm-hmm. learning how to drive and everything. And that's what he grew up driving was our models and like the coal fields of Tennessee. And yeah, he'd always talk very highly about them climb a tree and all, all this oh shit. yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah. You can do anything in those yep. so this truck that i got had like forty thousand miles because it came from the oil fields in texas and went five miles this way or five miles that way and just sat still and ran a uh a, a wet kit on some big pump trailer so like no miles no rust because it was in texas i mean it's just like so a those are probably the original the tires yeah they were i'm, I'm very <laughs> very positive that if they weren't the original tires there was just one set in between i mean it there's like the the clutch pedal is not worn down at all. Like I thought, forty thousand miles. There's no way this truck's from the '80s. But yeah, it's like all original. Everything's still nice and yeah, nice and tight. Yeah, so it's parked in a shed right now, and I'm. <laughs> it will not see Missouri road salt. It, I refuse to get it out in the winter time. It'll yeah. just haul grain at harvest in the summer. Gotcha. So what's the what's the winter truck? You got a Western Star, don't you? Yeah. Yep. I've got a really sharp Western Star, um, forty seven hundred, I believe, or forty nine hundred. And it pulls a, I can put it on the 40-foot end dump or the 40-foot hopper bottom. Gotcha. Sharp truck. Yeah. that Good running truck. Yeah. Gotcha. So, Grace, uh, you mind sharing anything about your family farm? Sure. So, 
Uh, my family farm is over 200 years old. I'm the eighth generation. So is that a land grant farm? Did they? So in our area, like, so one of the main farms that we farm was a land grant for Revolutionary War service. I didn't know if they did that in Western Kentucky or not. I don't think I'm it went that far. I'm actually not sure. I really don't know. I think it kind of stopped around. Like, I know parts of Ohio have land grant farms and parts of them don't. So I, I don't know if it goes that far hmm. or not. It kind of gets. A little that, confusing that's to a me. good 18, question. 18, 13, or 18, 18 13. Yeah. Okay. So we got there, or started farming in 1809, established in 1813. So it's been the same family the whole time. That's, mm -hmm. That is awesome. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. I know the, the farm I'm talking about, it was uh, 1798. And I don't think the actual family had farmed it since the 40s. So they'd ha always had a tenant farmer on there. But I see. Mm -hmm. Like, talk the, the fellow owned it when we started farming it just talking about their history and stuff it was I don't know, it was really cool to hear that yeah. kind of stuff i mean you talk about 200 years of family drama <laughs> mixed in yeah there. i know and you talk to my dad he knows just about everything there is to know that is that is really awesome you need to get him on a podcast and record that I stuff. i know i'm trying to get him to do a youtube video with me about it and yeah. just go over the history of everything highly advised i did the one with my dad about a month ago and i don't know it'll probably be my favorite it's not the most interesting YouTube video to everybody, but it's probably will always be my favorite. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, uh, is on your operation how many of how many of you are still in the family farming? So it's right now just me and my dad and my uncle that farm. Okay. So and I guess my great aunt she owns some land, but we farm it for. So. Gotcha. Okay. Out of. How many siblings? I have seven siblings. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> She's the only one that farms. Yeah. That's crazy. So for a long time, I was the only one that farmed. <laughs> My brother started farming with me a couple years ago. Yeah. Yep. So, so did you welcome him back in with open arms when he decided to come back? Or? Yeah, we need an employee. Ah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's that's pretty cool stuff. So um, also, what what is the name of the show that you're on? You're, I forgot but found out at dinner you're on a TV show, right? Yes. So I'm on a TV show called Live to Farm. It comes on RFD TV and Discovery Channel. Okay. So I just started doing that. I'm really excited for it. It's a lot of fun. So what does that show highlight? I mean, just the day-to-day -day of the farm? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So last year they came out for a day during harvest and just kind of followed me around all day just to see what I'm up to. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. So um, both of you have a pretty good social media presence. How does... Uh, is that kind of a challenge, I mean, as far as managing your day-to-day -day on the farm, or is it getting away much? I, the people always ask me that, and I don't notice it. But I, I don't think about it because it's such an integral part of my yeah. operation. Mm -hmm. It's just part of it because I've always, as the farm's grown, so is the social media. Um, but I hate editing YouTube videos, so, like, I can't <laughs> do the YouTube thing. But as far as, like, Instagram or TikTok goes, I'm just filming myself for 15 or 20 seconds and posting it, and I don't think about it ever again. So it, it doesn't really add any extra hours to my day. Yeah. Where if I was editing right. stuff all night, that would take a big chunk of my life. So. Yeah. yeah. It's not um, – I wouldn't say it really gets in the way of anything. It might take a couple extra minutes every once in a while to, like, set up a camera. But, of course, I don't notice it because I've gotten pretty used to it. But my dad, it was pretty new to him whenever I started doing it. But he never – acted like it was a huge burden so my answer is going to be it doesn't get in the way but yeah gotcha everybody's so, opinion is different so when the tv show started coming around what what was his opinion of that he thinks it's really cool okay he's pretty supportive of it the tv show is a little bit more right uh in the way i guess you could say um it doesn't really matter because it's only one day at yep. a time usually but it's definitely more involved right. than just setting up a camera and going on about your day yeah yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to think how to ask this and not sound like an idiot. We can cut this part out. But <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, Gavin, what does your dad think about it? But I don't know how to say that without sounding stupid. But like do your I mean, do They're, your parents or do they watch you on social media? Yeah, well Ted does not how to use the freaking internet. Like <laughs> that guy still has a flip phone. Yeah. He he didn't even know you could connect music to the Bluetooth on a vehicle. <laughs> So I connected my phone one day, and I was playing music that he hadn't heard in 30 years because he only hears it if it comes right. on the radio. So he I, thought it was magic. I connected Dad's phone to his combine, and then every time someone would call him and he'd be yeah. working on the combine, oh, God damn it, I can't hear him. <laughs> <laughs> but they're both extremely supportive. Mom, like if I post anything on Facebook, she's sharing it or liking it. Uh, Dad, you know, they both had town jobs their whole life, so like the risk of – 
like if it rains i make more money if it doesn't rain i don't make that much that kind of scares them but they're supportive if i need something from town dad will run to the parts store and grab it or bring us lunch out to the field if we can't go into town for food um and i think that's been huge is just having a family that's really supportive of my dreams uh yeah that's they're all on board for it. So how many employees have you had? That's one thing I was going to ask you. I mean, mm-hmm. with the popcorn being so labor intensive in some mm-hmm. aspects, I mean, do you have a couple employees working with you? I got a guy that works with me almost every day. He does his own thing too. I mean, he's also like a, he can travel, like he's a traveling welder. He went to welding school, but he's kind of my right hand man. Like when we're really busy in the spring and fall, he's around every single day, every morning. Um, and he can work late too. He really solid dude. Um, and then, like, there's a girl around Christmas time. One of my buddy's girlfriends. She'll help us package in the warehouse. Other than that, it's just mom or dad. I'm, I've got a younger brother. Um, if we get swamped, like, if we need someone in the grain cart because both the combines are running and trucks are running, then he'll come hop in a piece of equipment and help us out. Grace was in Missouri for a week, and she was running one of the combines. So I think you had a couple of flats that week, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're not going to – I don't even want to count them. <laughs> I'd run out of fingers, but, yeah. It, so it takes an army. It really does. But the thing about farming is it takes an army for a short amount of time, and then it right. like there's almost nothing. Right. So it's hard to find consistent labor around every day unless you have lots of stuff for them to do. So I wasn't sure with the popcorn if that was mm-hmm. enough, uh, manu- like you know, needing a large amount of labor force yeah. year round, or is it more? Is it also very seasonal? As it's grown, I'm kind of at wit's end. Like I need more people, but then again, like right at the I, threshold. Right. It's like. Who do I hire? What position do I hire them for? Do, are they going to do the packaging and I do the sales? Are they going to do the sales and I do the – I don't know. It's kind of – I don't know who's going to come along. But at some point, someone will fill some position and then it will keep growing again. Um, I don't know how to grow popcorn business. I'm like I'm totally winging it, you know. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I definitely need more labor. Gotcha. So moving forward, do you want to keep growing the popcorn business or do you want to stay mostly in row crop or just kind of see how it falls? I would love to grow the popcorn cause it's neat and it's not, you know, it's not like a battle of who can be the lowest cost producer. My name goes on the side of that bag and I decide what it sells for with corn and soybeans. There's a lot of established farmers around me and they do a great job and they've been around for generations and they own the land. And they own the equipment. They don't have any, you know, a lot of them don't have any debt. It's hard to compete with that, especially once we head into the next downturn. If I'm just trying to grow the row crop, I'm going to be one of the first guys out. You know, if it really turns into an 80 situation, like, I can't compete against them. I just get pushed out of the way. So that has grown the quickest, but the popcorn is where it's going to be at the next you know, long haul over my whole lifetime, I think the popcorn is what I need to be focusing on. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Any, uh, any parting words for the, uh, for the viewers? I don't know. Uh, dreams only work if you do. I've heard (laughs) you say that a few times. I I use that hashtag a lot. I put that in a lot of my captions. If that, I mean, if I can leave them with one thing, that's it. That's kind of a motto I live by. Go chase your dreams because no one else is going to do it for you. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty good advice, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, where can everybody find you guys on the socials? You f- ladies first. Oh, you want me to go first? Uh, the Farmer Grace on everything. Okay, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, t- yep. Twitter. Yep, everything. Facebook, gotcha. Uh, I'm Gavin, just Gavin Spore, Gavin underscore Spore on everything except TikTok. On TikTok, I'm the popcorn farmer. Uh, okay. So the popcorn farmer. The popcorn. popcorn farmer. But everything else is just my name, Gavin Spore. Okay. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate you guys uh, stopping out here and uh, making do in a hotel lobby. Yeah. <laughs> <That's the first laughs> show, so. Thanks for letting me uh, hop on oh, last minute here. No yeah. problem. That was <laughs> awesome.